Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back from Seattle. You might notice I've got a bit of a bonk in my head there. That's because I was working on the house and, you know, smacked my head. Didn't hurt, don't worry. Uh, I, first thing I noticed was I was bleeding. Good thing is I didn't collide into anything at orbital velocity since a lot of the things I talk about do tend to collide at orbital velocity and that was kind of in the news or rather it was in, it was on Twitter this week. In a very uncharacteristic series of tweets, ESA kind of took to Twitter to complain about SpaceX not moving their spacecraft, or rather, not really communicating correctly with ESA. It was a really um, odd thread in the way it was characterized because, you know, this was some this was ESA operations. They are obviously responsible for many many satellites. They regularly have to perform avoidance maneuvers every couple of weeks. And here's them taking to Twitter and sort of looking like they're complaining that their internet service provider isn't operating. Um, in fact, it was curious to see Matt Desch of Iridium saying, well, you know, we move our satellites every couple of weeks and we never go and publicly call out the other people on Twitter. But, you know, I understand where ESA is coming from because it, according to SpaceX, there was a bit of a communications glitch. But let's actually rewind and talk about what satellites were involved. So ESA last year launched a satellite called Aeolus. It is a science satellite that orbits around 300 kilometers up and it is looking at winds around the world. And just uh, last week it turned out the data showed that it was going to be passing very close to Starlink 44. That is one of the 60 odd satellites that were launched with Starlink. Most of the Starlink satellites were used their Krypton Hall effect thrusters to move to higher and higher orbits. They moved up to about 550 kilometers. But number 44 was interesting. It seemed to go down and then you start using atmospheric drag to deorbit itself. So it's not really clear exactly what their test is. I think they're just trying to show that they can deorbit it. Maybe the transmitter for the, um, you know, the phased array communication system isn't working whatever this one chose to go down instead of up and that brought it down through various uh, it means it's crossing paths with various spacecraft including aeolus um, about you know towards the end of august data from the socrates system uh, which is based on the you know, publicly available data on satellite orbits showed that it was going to pass sort of close and it had a one in fifty thousand chance of colliding and this is cause for concern, but actually it's not that much cause for concern. The threshold is probably one in 10,000. That's what they consider to be the point at which action should be taken. And if you wonder kind of how big this is, think about the fact that if you have a one square meter spacecraft and you put it in a 100 by 100 meter square, then that's 10,000 square meters. So, you know, any point any debris that hits one of those square meters has a one in 10,000 chance of hitting the satellite. So reasonably, that's like a 50 to 70 meter margin in terms of uh, you know, distance that you want to have. Um, anyway, yes, uh, what later happened was that better data came in from the US Air Force. And yeah, then uh, for some reason, SpaceX's ticketing system didn't work, they didn't get the message, and so ESA on its own, after not getting any response, no coordination with SpaceX, decided that they were going to raise the orbit of Aeolus just enough so that it would pass over the top. And as I said, it only needs to move up by, you know, 100 meters or so to be way in the safe zone. The space station, on the other hand, it needs to make much larger maneuvers. Typical maneuvers for the space station avoiding debris are like, you know, a third of a meter per second, half a meter per second, and that will give them clearances of kilometers by the time they actually get to the point of potential collision. Incidentally, to clean up another misconception, a lot of people think about the two objects flying to each other and think that an avoidance maneuver means you fire your thrusters to the left or the right or to go up or over. Actually, Typically, the spacecraft heading towards their you know, destiny, they will actually fire their engines forward so that they actually get there faster. And that just means that they get there earlier 
or, and they will also typically mean that they go over the top as well. Either way, um, that's the most efficient way to make these spacecraft move. And typically, they are having to make orbital maintenance maneuvers to keep their altitude high enough. So it doesn't always work out as a negative. So yeah, this is, this is something that's going to be much more important over time. Right now, satellite operators kind of are in the situation where they, none of them wants to really move their satellite because if you have to move your satellite, you have to spend propellant and propellant is what keeps your spacecraft working. If you don't have enough propellant, your spacecraft is essentially dead. So you're incentivized as a satellite operator to let the other person move. Therefore, satellite avoidance maneuvers are like a ridiculous game of chicken in space where you've got two things heading towards each other at kilometers per second and there's an incentive not to be the one that hits the brakes. I, I am sure disasters may eventually happen at some point. The, the, you know, you have to realize there's really no central authority, no central space traffic control at this time that's saying you should move your satellite because you came here second and you're getting in the way of this satellite that's been here forever. They have, you know, they have priority there. You know, you're deorbiting, they're wanting to maintain an orbit. Uh, and to be clear, the Krypton thrusters on the Starlink, they are very, very low thrust. But if you look at the rate at which they raised their orbit, they were able to raise their orbit by about 200 meters per orbit. So that is more than enough, even for these low, uh, low thrust, high specific impulse Krypton thrusters to be able to, you know, avoid any reasonable object. Now, Starlink is, of course, planning to be a much, much larger constellation. And while ESA handles, you know, a whole bunch of satellites, SpaceX is currently handling 60 odd satellites in space as part of its Starlink. And it will be handling maybe 10 to 100 times this number easily in the future. And it's going to have to coordinate these things automatically. According to SpaceX, the satellites are supposed to perform collision avoidance maneuvers more or less without human supervision, that if you just set the system up and let it coordinate, it will make these maneuvers. But that being said, I think humans being in the loop is probably still a good thing at this time. ESA's series of tweets also highlighted their use of AI and automation to identify and classify maneuvers that need to be taken to op you know, optimize their whole system as well. So it was as much them complaining about SpaceX as it was saying, hey, by the way, we're working on this cool technology, which they absolutely should be working on. I'm not sure that ESA should have come out the way they did, but I definitely think that perhaps SpaceX should make sure that their system is responding correctly. Now, some of you might wonder what it would actually look like from the satellite's point of view. And I can actually go to Kerbal Space Program to show you. I can put two spacecraft in intersecting orbits. Now, in Kerbal Space Program, the orbital velocity is only 2.2 kilometers per second. So I put two things on a, an orbit heading towards each other. That's 4.5 kilometers per second or thereabouts. That's actually kind of low. The, Aeolus and Starlink 44 would have had a closing speed of 14.4 kilometers per second. So this is, this is way faster than what we have in this simulation. But if you watch it, it is literally a case of blink and you will miss it. It flies past. And if I actually pause it and step through it, you can start to see the frames. And there's a couple of frames. There's like one frame where you can really see the two satellites on the screen together and then they're gone. Given that this, this is supposed to be running at 60 frames per second and the closing velocity is 400, sorry, four kilometers per second, they're moving about 75 meters every frame. And that also explains why these two spacecraft in this simulation didn't actually collide. They passed through each other because the collision system in Kerbal Space Program just looks for when the two objects are inside each other on this frame. But if they're stepping towards each other and they pass through each other, it doesn't count because it doesn't figure out where they were during the previous frame. So if I say replace one of the targets with a much larger object, such as this 
fine simulation of a Star Destroyer. Not a real scale Star, Star Destroyer, but still large enough. Sure enough, that tiny, velocity, uh, sat tiny satellite smashes into the Star Destroyer with great aggression and renders it destroyed. Rather like Admiral Holdo. Anyway, the truth is, for all the interpersonal drama on Twitter, most of these collision avoidance manoeuvres have only one party that can do anything. Most of the avoidance manoeuvres are against debris that is essentially dead and inert. As of right now, they're tracking something like 19,000 individual objects in space. 8,000 tonnes of hardware is sitting up there in space. And you can't ask most of it to move out the way because it is dead and isn't working anymore. So the truth is that even if SpaceX, OneWeb, Amazon, whatever, put thousands of satellites into space, this may still be less of a problem because these are still able to navigate and control themselves and provide detailed uh, positional information to the ground stations so that they can accurately measure their chances of collisions. And I think in the future, we're just going to see these clusters being smarter and more able to actively coordinate these things. Because, yeah, you know, if you've got one set of satellites making a couple of maneuvers uh, a week, when you've got thousands of objects, they're all going to have to carefully coordinate each other and they'll have to start making these maneuvers without being requested, without humans having to clear and authorize every single um, you know, change in orbit, every single avoidance maneuver. So yeah, for the foreseeable future, I hope that space remains as free from Kessler syndrome as possible. And yeah, until the next time, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.